Welcome to A Jolt of Joy on the Charisma Podcast Network. I'm your host, Bible teacher and author, Carol McLeod. As you probably know by now, I love digging for gold in the Word of God. I believe that the Bible is living and active and has the power to change our lives today. Our current series is titled Meanwhile, Meeting God in the Wait, and it's a rich, historical, and powerful view into the life of Joseph of the Old Testament. Joseph is my favorite Old Testament character, and I believe that he might become yours as well. Today's episode is number six in this series, so let's dig in and get started. First of all, let me read you a quote from the book, The Rabbi's Heartbeat. When God comes streaming into our lives in the power of his word, all he asks is that we be stunned and surprised, let our mouths hang open, and begin to breathe deeply. That's the way I feel about the Word of God. I'm stunned and surprised every time that I read it. We left Joseph in the throne room with the great and terrible Pharaoh. Joseph humbly but directly presented godly counsel to Pharaoh about dealing with the imminent and fierce challenges that were ahead for Egypt and really for all of the world. The dreams of Pharaoh were interpreted by Joseph to mean that Egypt would enjoy seven years of abundance, followed by seven years of extreme food scarcity. The switch from feast to famine would take place quickly, but God had prepared Joseph. God saw Joseph as a leader when his brothers were beating him up. God saw Joseph's potential when he was in the pit and riding along a dusty road in the Midianite caravan. God watched Joseph's life with grand anticipation when he was a servant in Potiphar's house and in the Egyptian prison. God's view of Joseph has not changed at all because God always saw Joseph as a leader despite his circumstances rather than because of them. Joseph was a man of honor and faith. Therefore, God was able to use him wherever he went and whoever he was with. My friend, God does not define you by your circumstances, but by the faith of your heart. 1 Samuel 16, 7 tells us, For God sees not as the man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God views you through heaven's perspective. His gaze is upon you from the vantage point of eternity. You know, I can't help but wonder how Joseph intended to convince successful farmers hauling in extraordinarily abundant crops to hand over 20% of their harvest to the government. You see, famine was virtually unknown in this region of the world. They'd never had a famine before. I'm sure that Joseph's idea sounded ridiculous to the agricultural elite of the day, and I wonder if the counselors and the wise men of Pharaoh rolled their pompous eyes at the bravado of this kid straight from prison. Now let Pharaoh look for a man discerning and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh take action to appoint overseers in charge of the land and let him exact a fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven years of abundance. Then let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain for food in the cities under Pharaoh's authority and let them guard it. Let the food become as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine, which will occur in the land of Egypt so that the land will not perish during the famine. Now the proposal seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his servants. What you and I know due to our historical perspective is that Joseph's idea was offered from an entirely different throne room altogether. The king of the ages had spoken to Joseph, and this young man was simply downloading that insight to a very temporary ruler. Would it even be possible to find a man with the stellar leadership qualities that Joseph's proposition required? Would this particular man be able to convince the leading agricultural experts of the day to give one-fifth of their harvest and place it in government grain bins? Where was such a man? Well, before we discover who Pharaoh chooses, let's pause and examine the throne rooms where you spend the hours, days, and years of your life. 
If God were to speak to you with an extraordinary answer, as he did to Joseph, would you even be able to hear his voice? If all you focus on is yourself, your requirements, and your disappointment, let me humbly present to you that you may be in danger of worshiping yourself rather than God. Do you spend the vast amount of your time in a throne room wallpapered with selfies? Do you analyze situations but forget to ask God for his analysis? Do you avoid decisions until you hear what other people think you should do while failing to ask God for his take on your choice? What do you want, my friend? Do you want what you want or do you want what God wants for your life? I love this quote by one of my heroines of the faith, Elizabeth Elliot. To pray, thy will be done, I must be willing, if the answer requires it, that my will be undone. Are you spending your life in the throne room of the kingdoms of this world? The throne room of culture will tell you what is culturally and currently acceptable. The throne room of self focuses on personal feelings. It's in the throne room of God that the word of God has final and joyful authority. You see, Joseph was more aware of the eternal throne room of God than he was of the throne room of Pharaoh, a transient ruler. Joseph wasn't intimidated by earthly influences. He lived solely to honor the heavenly one. Pharaoh likely pondered the advice offered to him by Joseph, who was fresh from the dungeon. Perhaps Pharaoh ceased pacing, ascended his throne, and quietly sat down. The pervasive question was this one. Do I have a man on my team who will be able to do what this God of Joseph requires? Apparently, Pharaoh and his servants quickly discussed the plan because the Bible reports Genesis 41, 37. Now the proposal seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his servants. At this time in history, Egypt was a pagan nation. Thus, the God of Joseph was a stranger to Pharaoh. And into this confusing and pagan religious structure, Joseph arrives on the scene and starts talking about God. Next time you are in an intimidating situation where your Lord and Savior is not honored or known, remember the courage of Joseph and insert your faith into the conversation. The famed theologian F.B. Meyer wrote of Joseph, though stripped of his coat, he was not stripped of his character. Remember that you and I are symbolically Joseph in this historical account written in scripture. We must cleave to our character and to the promise of God even when the culture in which we are living is void of commitment to Jesus Christ. And then Genesis 41, 38. Then Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is a divine spirit? A more accurate translation of this verse is, and Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the spirit of God is? So this descriptive phrase, a man in whom the spirit of God is, might be one of the most glorious illustrations in all of scripture. In the Hebrew, it is Ruha Elohim, which means on whom God has breathed. The Hebrew words Ruha and Elohim, when used together, denote the breath of God and is often actually translated as the Holy Spirit. It was the Ruha of God that hovered over the deep before creation. It was the Ruha of God that breathed over the land at the end of the flood and caused the waters to dry up. The Bible reports that Daniel possessed an excellent spirit or Ruah because he had made up his mind to serve the Lord in the midst of a heathen culture. Have you allowed the breath of God to inspire your life? Have you asked the Holy Spirit to give you more strength than you could ever have had on your own? Are you determined to live in such a way that all of creation will recognize the breath of God on your one glorious life. Pharaoh realized that human strength and knowledge would not sufficiently enable him to feed the population during the tenuous days ahead. 
He needed a man with the spirit of the living God pouring through his very soul. Joseph might have taken a step or two back, believing that his job had been accomplished, and yet he had to wait for dismissal. He dared not leave prior to Pharaoh's permission for him to be excused. Pharaoh, dressed in grandeur, sitting on the highest throne in all the known world, was in a conundrum. What man on his staff could succeed at this gargantuan responsibility? Pharaoh, as he sat there, tapping his head, looking into the distance, might have slapped the arm of his golden throne and jumped up with excitement. He may have pointed his bejeweled finger at Joseph, freshly shaved from prison and exclaimed, it's you, Joseph, it's only you, it must be you. Joseph's life is about to immediately change because of the Ruha Elohim that was so very evident in his life. Pharaoh's sobered concern was suddenly turned to unbridled enthusiasm when he named Joseph as the second highest ranking official in all of Egypt. Genesis 41, verses 39 through 40. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has informed you of all this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and according to your command, all my people shall do homage. Only in the throne, I will be greater than you. The appointment of Joseph to the vice presidency of Egypt was unprecedented and shocking. I wonder if the other officials in the rooms gasped as Pharaoh made his surprising choice. A young man, fresh from prison, not even an Egyptian? The Ruah Elohim made a way where there seemed to be no way for Joseph. The Lord was with him in the pit, in prison, and now in the palace. Pharaoh began his appointment of Joseph with these words, since God informed you of all this. Pharaoh realized that the God of Joseph held the answer to all the challenges Egypt was about to face. Joseph possessed in himself no intrinsic ability to solve huge problems, but God who was within him was more than able. May I remind you that you serve the same God that Joseph did? What amazing information! The God who lived in Joseph also lives in you. As you tap into his power and knowledge, you too may have been given assignments that make no sense in the natural. God is still looking for a few good men and a few good women who will honor him in the midst of a secular culture and in spite of a meanwhile experience. Are you that woman? Are you that man? Joseph, in one instant of time, went from being a sordid, disrespected prisoner with no hope of ever getting out of the dungeon to the number two man in all of Egypt. Talk about a meanwhile miracle. This is it. Genesis 41, verse 40. And you shall be over my house, and according to your command, all my people shall do homage. Only in the throne I will be greater than you. Joseph is considered the equivalent of vice president or perhaps prime minister of the day. The hand of God was moving in the life of Joseph, and we are in the grandstands of faith cheering him on. I would humbly like to submit to you today that Joseph knew he was number two, but not to Pharaoh. Joseph knew he was second in authority to God and to God alone. In the remaining narrative of Joseph's life in the book of Genesis, not one derogatory statement is made concerning him. He is only one of two other characters in scripture that this can be said of, Daniel and Jesus Christ. We, of course, know that neither Joseph nor Daniel were without sin as Christ was. But the resounding truth is, Joseph lived with immaculate honor. Genesis 41, 41 through 42. Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put the gold necklace around his neck. The king's signet ring was symbolic of his ruling power and authority. As the ruling royal in Egypt, 
Pharaoh did not sign documents with a quill, but instead he dipped his signet ring into wax and then placed the symbol of the king on the document. Pharaoh freely gave Joseph his power of attorney with the gift of the ring. Joseph could now sign the name of the king on decision-making legal papers. Joseph no longer wore prison garments because he was a free man. Pharaoh now required that Joseph be dressed in the royal manner of fine linen. Joseph was stripped of the very colored tunic decades ago that his earthly father had bestowed upon him. He had lost his servant's garment to Potiphar's conniving wife, and he's now taken off his prison garb. Finally, Pharaoh presents Joseph with a tire reserved for royalty. And my friend, you are royalty. Your dad is the king of all kings. Put on your garment of praise and sing loudly enough for the world to hear. Give voice to your one unquenchable song. Refuse to go through life wearing the sackcloth of yesterday's disappointments. And may I just say, you look smashing in your garment of praise. Pharaoh then placed a heavy gold necklace on Joseph, representative of his affiliation with the royal family. This piece of stunning heirloom jewelry surely marked the royal ancestry for generations. As a believer in Jesus Christ, when you were set free from the bondage of sin, invited into the throne room of God's presence, something stunning occurred in your life. You were welcomed as an intimate member of the wonderful family of God. Joseph's life was revolutionized in one stunning moment when God intervened. His meanwhile was now coming to a conclusion as Pharaoh continued to shower this young man with blessings and favor. Genesis chapter 41, verses 43 through 46. Pharaoh had Joseph ride in his second chariot and they proclaimed before him, bow the knee. And he set him over all the land of Egypt Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, though I am Pharaoh, yet without your permission, no one shall raise his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh named Joseph Zephanath Paniah, and he gave him Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, as his wife. And Joseph went forth over the land of Egypt. Now Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. Joseph was given the honor of riding in Pharaoh's second chariot. He had Air Force Two at his very disposal. Joseph not only dressed differently, ate differently, and lived differently than he had while in prison, but now he traveled differently as well. You and I have been given the miraculous vehicle of prayer in which to travel through life. We're not constrained by our circumstances or events. Prayer will take us to powerful places in stunning and unmatched style. I wonder, was Joseph jumping up and down yet? Was he weeping for joy? Was he kneeling in awe of all that was happening? Pharaoh had not only given Joseph freedom, authority, new clothes, a family heirloom, and a vehicle in which to travel, but he also gave him a new name. Joseph's new name means God speaks, giving life to the world. Isn't that just extraordinary? Pharaoh declared Joseph's destiny over him with this brand new name. God had spoken through Joseph and given him a plan to save the world during a famine. Did you realize that God wants to speak through you as well? God deeply desires for his eternal life to live through your miraculous life, bringing joy to the world. Just as Joseph was given a new name by Pharaoh, you too have been given a new name. When you offered yourself to the unshakable kingdom of Christ, your new name became beloved and saved. Your new name is free, powerful, and forgiven. There's a wondrous blessing that comes to a man or woman who spends time in the throne room of the king of all kings. 
Those who choose to spend time in his presence are now set free from the pain of the past. They wear the garment of praise. They're transported by the vehicle of prayer. The family lineage has been realigned. They are given authority and they have the honor of a new identity. It happens because we serve a God who always keeps his promises. I have always loved Psalm 138.8. The Lord will accomplish what concerns me. Your loving kindness, O Lord, is everlasting. Do not forsake the works of your hands. When you, as a daughter of God, walk through life with honor and integrity, you will receive the Joseph blessing. When you live with moral excellence and undeniable trust, the Joseph blessing will follow you all the days of your life. In one ordinary man by the name of Joseph, at one terrible moment in human history, we observe the favor of the eternal God. Due to the faithful resolve of Joseph, the blessings of God followed him wherever he went. Genesis 41, 47 through 9. During the seven years of plenty, the land brought forth abundantly. So he gathered all the food of these seven years, which occurred in the land of Egypt, and placed the food in the cities. He placed in every city the food from its own surrounding fields. Thus Joseph stored up grain in great abundance like the sand of the sea until he stopped measuring it, for it was beyond measure. The prosperity was so enormous at Joseph's moment in Egyptian history that they were unable to measure the wealth and the abundance. How does this happen? It happens when an ordinary man or a common woman determines that he or she will partner with the eternal God to make a resounding difference at his or her moment in history. That's when the extraordinary occurs. My friend, remember, you serve a God who turns all of your meanwhiles into miracles. Well, if you enjoyed today's teaching on a jolt of joy, I'd like to encourage you to buy a copy of my most recent book, Meanwhile, Meeting God in the Wait. Also available are the eight videos to enhance your study in this rich look at the life of Joseph. The book is available on my website, carolmccloudministries.com, on Amazon, of course, ironstreammedia.com, and wherever books are sold. The video teaching series is only available on my website, carolmccloudministries.com, and at ironstreammedia.com. I'd love to hear from you, so feel free to email me at carol at carolmccloudministries.com. We love to pray for everyone who connects with us, so be sure and send me your personal prayer request. I want to remind you today that when you choose Jesus, you're choosing joy. His will for your life is an inexpressible and relentless joy. Don't ever doubt it. And as always, I dare you to choose joy.